Uh, well, I want to first to th thank uh, Kenneth for this invitation. It's always uh, an honor and a big pleasure. Uh, it's very encouraging to have a dialogue with a not entirely academic audience, uh, particularly with companions, candidates from unions. Uh, the dominant discourse agenda um, on migration, development, and human rights has been misleading and basically responds to corporate interests. It essentially disregards human and labor rights as central and intrinsic topics of the agenda. It overlooks the multiple violations and criminalization suffered by migrants and their families. In addition, it obscures the root causes of migration, masks the contributions made by migrants to destination countries, and ignores the costs uh, of migration for the countries of origin, costs that are far beyond the overemphasized uh, positive impact of remittances. The purpose of my presentation is to provide some key elements for reframing the debate on migration, development, and human rights with particular emphasis on its relevance regarding the labor question today. Um, my presentation will be divided in four parts, which I will go very briefly with the uh, uh, aid of Eva. Uh, I will first draw some crucial elements of the context in which labor market restructuring and contemporary capitalist uh, migration takes place. Then I will say a few words regarding the nature of the new migratory dynamic, what I regard as forced migration. The third part will focus on several key indicators uh, that enable a north-south balance on, my, on the migration development problematic with evidence from the US-Mexico corridor. Uh, here again, I, I think we can make uh, uh, so, some statistic uh, talk. Uh, if we are able to recodify the, these statistics. Uh, and this, uh, I think, is, could be a very powerful tool for debate and discussion. And I've been doing this in, in some UN settings with, I think, very powerful results. So I want to show you, this is why I'm using a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I hopefully will end up with a few conclusions. It is impossible to disentangle the migration, development, and human rights nexus without a deep understanding of the nature of the current global capitalist system, namely neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism. Against the myth of free market, because what we actually have is a highly monopolistic market which a huge portion of it subject to outsourcing operations and intra-firm trade, there are two fundamental strategic and structural aspects of this concept that are worth considering. They are key landmarks of the restructuring process of capitalists in the neoliberal era that are often overlooked. The first one is the internationalization of capital, which refers to the restructuring strategy led by the large multinational corporations, which through outsourcing operations and subcontracting uh, sub chains, expands part of, uh, parts of the productive commercial and services processes to the periphery in search of cheap and flexible labor as well as natural resources. 66 million workers today are uh, involved in such outsourcing operations in the global south. And a similar proportion of vulnerable immigrants labor is in the north, uh, subject to vulnerable 
labor conditions. I have tried to give a different name instead of global commodity change to these two, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think a better concept is global networks of monopoly capital. Uh, the second point that I want to make is the restructuring of innovation system. This, is a, this aspect of neoliberal capitalism involves the implementation of mechanisms such as outsourcing and offshore outsourcing in the scientific and technological innovation sphere, allowing multinational corporations to have southern scientists at their service, reduce labor costs, transfer risks and responsibilities, and capitalize on the benefits of purchasing and concentrating patents. In line with the above uh, mega trends, one of the main engines of, the, of neoliberal capitalism is by all means the cheapening of labor, taking advantage of the massive oversupply of workforce or, or the configuration of a gigantic global reserve army. With the dismantling of the ex-Soviet Union, the incorporation of China, and the liberation of labor through the implementation of structural adjustment programs in the periphery, the supply of labor for capital more than double in the last two decades, from 1.5 to 3.3 billion. This has led to the ex uh, expansion of this fuzzy concept of informality uh, and the emergence of extreme labor exploitation conditions. According to ILO figures, more than half of the world's labor is subject to vulnerable working conditions. This means 1.7 billion. 900 million, nearly 30% of the workforce, global workforce, earn wages of $2 per day or less. 204 million are unemployed. With the advent of neoliberal capitalism, there has been a reconfiguration of the proletariat. When working conditions erode, the social wage and the social welfare system excludes the subordinate classes from accessing basic social needs to such a degree that wages no longer ensure subsistence. They configure it as a situation of super exploitation. Once naturalized in neoliberal capitalism, super exploitation systematically disrupts the value of the workforce, affecting the lives of the majority of the population. The concept of unequal exchange, characterized uh, by the trends towards the deepening of asymmetries between countries and regions, and uh, increased social inequality, um, is nowadays uh, in, a, in one of its most exacerbated points. Accept, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this is, I think, a, a very crucial issue. Um, a key element for understanding the configuration of an equal development under neoliberal capitalism is the implementation of structural adjustment programs. They have been the vehicle for disarticulating the productive apparatus in the periphery and its rearticulation to the core economies under sharp asymmetric and subordinated condition. The exportation of, of labor, direct via migration and indirect through outs offshore outsourcing operations is a key element for conceptualizing this process. In, uh, in this regard, the exportation of labor has become a key element of the new international division of labor. This new 
division of labor resembles a re-edition of enclave economies in the periphery and encompasses the emergence of, a, of new modalities of unequal exchange, much more severe than in the past, um, the net transfer of revenues through outsourcing operations in the South and the transfer of social reproduction and educational costs of the migration labor. The new migratory demand, the, uh, dynamic is composed mainly from, of, by South, North, and South, South flows. Uh, they encompass about 72% of the whole uh, international migration. As, as Stephen just mentioned, there are around 750 million uh, internal migrants. Uh, this means that one out of every seven inhabitants of this planet is a migrant, clearly revealing that migration has become an essential component of the new global architecture and uh, a, a highly vulnerable sec segment of the working class. Uh, well, I, I also want to refer that, that migration to this is basically an expulsion process, triggered by the dismantling of the productive apparatus in the South. The dynamic of unequal development has led to the mass migration of dispossessed, marginalized, and excluded populations. The result is a flow of persons who are literally expelled from their places of origin, striving for subsistence. They, they face increasingly restrictions to mobility, growing criminalization of the migrant workforce, depreciating it and subjecting it to conditions of high vulnerability, social exclusion, precariousness, and extreme exploitation. Well, I will skip this. Uh, these are some of the categories of what uh, are forced migration. And I wanted to emphasize basically this, that economic migration has become more and more forced migration. And now, <coughs> going very quickly, the Mexico-US corridor is by far the largest migration corridor in the world. This slide, um, and the next one will give you a, a, a brief idea of the, of the importance of Mexico-U.S. migration. This is uh, Mexican migration as compared to uh, the rest of Latin American migration. And, the, and this, one's, uh, in, in this one you can see uh, the first uh, group of, of, of migrants why Mexicans are all over the U.S. geography uh, today. But what I wanted really to start with is noticing the exponential growth of U.S. migration since the implementation. Migration has a long history in Mexico of more than 100 years. But it has grown exponentially uh, since the, in, the, in the neoliberal era. And it, even uh, it, it grew much uh, faster at a, uh, at a really exponential uh, growth uh, with the signature of uh, NAFTA, the uh, Free Trade Agreement, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. It's now slowing down, as, as you can see. Um, from, um, but I, I'll show it in this, in this graph. In this slide, it becomes clear that the peak in the immigration flow of, of Mexicans was the beginning of, 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 of this century, and that since then it has been declining, particularly since 2004, and that this movement is correlated with the employment rates in the U.S. The threat that Mexicans were taking U.S. jobs is essentially a myth. Uh, that goes against evidence. Regarding root causes, in this slide I can, it can be appreciated that the relative manufacturing productivity gap between the U.S. and Mexico 
As an indicator of growing asymmetries among both countries has been steadily increasing in the last 15 years, while the rate of emigration has uh, followed exactly the opposite path. This behavior is quite compelling uh, along the NAFTA era, demonstrated the failure of this regional integration accord to reduce productivity gaps and stabilize or reduce migration flows at, as it was promised. In harmony with the previous slide, this shows another angle of the asymmetries between Mexico and the US. The undersupply of labor in the US economy and the oversupply of labor in Mexico. This not only shows a complementary relationship in the labor market at a at, at transnational level, but perhaps much more importantly, it also reveals a consequence of the asymmetric regional integration process among the two nations, which underlines a process of unequal exchange. I will skip this, uh, but uh, I, was, I, was, I was going to show something about how uh, immigration is contributing to demographic balance in, 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 in the U.S. And, and uh, that Mexico is exporting its demographic dividend. And this is compromising the development of Mexico's future. Half of Mexican of Mexico is uh, having, uh, Mexican municipalities are having negative growth uh, rates at this point. But I think this is very, very important. In this slide, uh, you can see the contributions of uh, immigrants to the growth of the GDP in the U.S. I, I, I chose this period because uh, I didn't want to see the impact of, 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 of the crisis. Uh, but 32%, nearly 32% of the GDP, uh, GDP growth of the U.S. is supported by immigrants. 17% by Latin Americans and 11% by Mexicans. It is paradoxical that this contribution is not only not recognized, but instead it is payback with criminalization. <laughs> Mexico has the highest amount of undocumented migrants living in the U.S., nearly 7 million, 56% of, of the whole immigrants from Mexico. And this slide shows economic discrimination of migrants. They earn 32% less uh, according to the contribution to productivity in the U.S. And, uh, and white natives, not Latin Americans, receive 5% more. Well, migrants contribute to, uh, to, to uh, they, they pay taxes, even they are not uh, uh, undocumented, even they are undocumented uh, migrants. Uh, here they show that they are paying as far as uh, 50, nearly 53 billion US dollars. Um, this is another uh, myth, uh, for every dollar, paid by a U.S. Uh, native, white, non-Latin American, they receive $1.4 dollars of public social benefits. Whereas immigrants from, uh, uh, from peripheral countries, uh, especially from Latin America, 50 cents, and Mexicans, 20 cents, and undocumented ma migrants, 20 cents. I, I think this is quite interesting because uh, one of every four pensions in the U.S. is supported by an immigrant, mainly from the South. And one of every five is supported by an undocumented immigrant. Um, so this um, goes against a lot of 
prejudices, especially by the um, um, elder people in the, in the U.S. that are against immigration. And I'm about to conclude. Um, from, the, from a sending country perspective, remittances are not a panacea, nor a pathway out of, of, uh, of development, for development, sorry. If we compare the accumulated amount of remittances with the cost of migration, considering the age and level of education of migrants at the time they leave Mexico, using conservative estimates based on, on official data, public education figures and basic food requirements, we come up with the fact that in the NAFTA era, the cost paid by Mexico in education and basic social reproduction cost of its migrants nearly doubles the accumulated amount of remittances. This implies, clearly implies, a subsidy from the sending to the receiving country, um, or a modality of unequal exchange, if you wish, that is not compensated by remittances. And my last slide. <laughs> to conclude, building a strategic platform for social transformation capable of fueling a counter-hegemonic social power is an urgent task in the context of the current global crisis and beyond. It demands uh, the concourse of collective knowledge and intelligentsia at the service of the working class in alliance with social organizations and social movements. This project has already seen important advances as evidenced by initiatives from within civil society such as People's Global Action on Migration, Development and Human Rights, and the World Social Forum on Migration, among others. We need academics that reject being imprisoned in an ivory tower and are willing to work hand in hand with civil society organizations. For these crucial tasks, much more networking through the development of alternative research agendas is needed. And also it is needed to educate new generations of scholars, working class intellectuals, or public or organic intellectuals. And uh, I couldn't resist to, 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 to say this uh, as my last <laughs> point. Uh, academics and workers of the world, Unite. Thank you. <laughs>